Welcome to SolarTechDIY.com. This is Patrick speaking. I'm going to demonstrate how to pour encapsulant onto your solar panel. The very same encapsulant that we de-aired or removed the bubbles from. Right now I'm using a uh, laser temperature gauge, not to test the temperature, but because it has a red laser pointer. I wanted to draw your attention to the plumber's putty that sits in the grooves between the frame and the bus wire, or in some cases, the solar cell. We'll get back to that why we do that in a minute. Leveling is very important. Uh, I'm using dual levels. Now, of course, off camera, I made sure that it was very level. Uh, and I just showed you just one method of uh, using a pair of levels. Uh, need to ensure that the level is applied across all four corners. You just need to make sure it's level. When pouring the encapsulant, remember it's very, very viscous. It's very thick. So you want to pour it in a very controlled manner. Uh, it's one of those substances that it pours out slowly, sort of like molasses. Uh, not quite as bad as molasses, but pours out slowly. But if you get impatient and tilt the jar or your pour container even a little bit too much, it comes out like an avalanche. So it takes control. And what you want to do is first pour the encapsulant in between the cells and in between the strings, and then around the outer perimeter between the strings and the plumber's putty. The plumber's putty acts like a dam in essence because quite frankly this encapsulant costs money. So it's very wasteful to allow the encapsulant to flow freely and cover areas that don't benefit from the encapsulant. It's just a, a it's an economic decision to consume less of the the encapsulant by cordoning off areas you don't want it to flow. And the way you use the plumber's putty, uh, which by the way is very inexpensive, I, I think the small tubs I was using cost less than two dollars at Ace Hardware. So uh, every situation will be different. As you look at the string at the top of this cell where the jar is currently, and well, it's already gone now, but that top string is longer than the other three on the panel. So we would have, in fact, we do have far less room between the end of the string, the tabbing wire where we connect the end runs, and the edge of the frame. So there, if you look at the right hand side, in fact, I have a portion where I used zero encapsulant because, uh, I'm sorry, zero plumber's putty because there was no room. It's so tightly uh, joined in there. But the rest of the space, you can see, in the, especially in the middle two strings, there's quite a bit of open space. Hence, quite a bit of plumber's putty. When we're done, when the encapsulant cures and it's solid, we're going to go back and remove all the plum, plumber's putty. Very easy to do. It doesn't solidify. It comes right up. No muss, no fuss. Eh, a little bit gooey. Not, not too bad. It's not like picking up snails or anything. Uh, you won't be grossed out. I don't think you can reuse the plumber's putty. I've never tried because uh, remember it's got encapsulant mixed in with it so now it's oily and it's probably not reusable. So uh, just remember when you're forming up the plumber's putty, you roll it into um, pretty much the equivalent of oil booms that you see ringing ships out in the ocean or on lakes that are leaking oil. So they, you know, they put the booms out there to keep the oil from flowing underneath. Same principle. You just don't want the encapsulant to flow underneath the plumber's putty. Um, so you're very much in control of how much or little you use. You don't need a whole lot. Um, note that I used the same jar 
to pour the encapsulant that I used to de-air the encapsulant. And the reason for that is if we were to pour that encapsulant into another container, you know, perhaps one that's specifically designed for pouring, uh, as you saw with the jar, there's really no reason. The jar provided adequate flow control and uh, you know, unless you have unusually small hands and you just can't hold a jar, I, I really don't see a reason why you transfer it into a different container. And the primary reason you wouldn't is that when you turn that jar over to pour the contents into the, to the new pour container, that process will introduce air into your encapsulant as it goes through that turbulent transfer and falling into the new container. And so, you know, it's possible you could introduce enough air bubbles to render your de-airing uh, invalid. And then, you know, you're going to pour it back into the jar, de-air it. And you see where I'm going there? So it's just best to use the same jar. Uh, you saw how I poured around in between the strings, around the edges, and then running up and down in the very narrow space in between the cells. Now, we started to talk about that top string, why it's so much longer than the bottom three, and that's because I used that top string as an example when shooting a video on spacing the uh, pairs, or spacing the cells when you're making your pairs. I typically don't use anything. I just eyeball it, as you can see uh, down below. Uh, yeah, there are some maybe some minor inconsistencies. Um, I can spot a few, but generally um, I feel pretty comfortable with that. And you can either space them or not. The only the only warning is be cognizant of the size of frame that you have to work with because if you make too large of a space between your solar cells, you can space yourself right off your substrate. And as you can see at this angle, we are just at the, the point of no return. We are perfectly aligned with the frame. Now, that's, that was by design, but you know, if, if I didn't measure it and wasn't paying attention, we, we could have really um, rendered this a, a problem. Uh, luckily we didn't. Uh, now the paintbrush is being used to spread out the uh, encapsulant over the, the backs of the cells. You want uniform coverage and you know it's difficult for you at home to see how much material I'm moving around but it's not much at all. It's only uh, perhaps a millimeter uh, layer uh, because we, we want it to be uh, both in between the tempered glass and the sun facing side of the cell, but we also want a healthy coat on this side I'm working with, which remember our acronym for the back side? Anyone? Anyone jump in there? Bonus points if you get it. That's right, BP. Remember British, British Petroleum? But in our case, it's the back of the cell and BP back positive. So we are providing a nice even uh, coverage on the positive side of the cells. And the idea is you want this encapsulant to cover all of the surfaces. It doesn't need to be two inches thick. You know, you're not building armor plating. It, it's merely to protect the cells and wiring from the elements. And when I talk about the elements, not only heat and moisture, but insects, birds, uh, you know, you, you want a good barrier between these delicate cells and nature. Uh, and any one of these encapsulants will do that nicely. And an additional benefit is that um, they allow for movement of the solar cells in extreme temperature uh, periods. It's when it cures, it's almost like rubber, uh, but soft yet firm. I know that sounds like a duality. Pick one, but it's you can put kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. You, know, you poke it and it bounces back. Um, that's very important for these cells. It helps to protect against um, 
microfractures. Now, a concern here, this method that I used, if you'll recall, we filmed some how-to videos where we secured our strings to the substrate with little dabs of silicone caulking, clear silicone caulking. Now that makes it great to work with. As you can see, I'm applying a little bit of pressure with the brush. Had we not secured our strings, these strings would be moving all over that glass. And I just prefer not to have that movement. I like it set and I can wire, uh, solder and work with the wires knowing I'm not going to jeopardize any of these strings. But you don't have to do that. In fact, there's a lot of people who like to uh, commence the encapsulating process with a blank slate. They just like to pour a very thin layer on to the glass itself and then add the strings. I've done that too. Uh, nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, it does help to prevent air pockets underneath the cells, you know, on the opposite side from where we're working right now. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a two-sided coin because, yeah, you do start with a thin layer on the substrate, but you are going to create air pockets when you lay these strings down onto the substrate. It's only natural. Air will get trapped. So is it half a dozen of one, six of the other? I don't know. I think it just becomes a matter of personal preference. Um, I will show you the end result here once this cures. Um, I'll show you how we eliminated the air pockets. But look what I'm doing with this brush. I'm pushing down with the brush but at an angle so that the bristles are splayed out and they're distributing the weight that I'm putting on the cells because I'll go to each cell and apply that same pressure just pushing down at an angle with the brushes splayed out and it helps to massage the air from underneath the cells and you'll actually see it bubbling out from the sides as you move your brush around. Uh, the brush can be used to apply a little more pressure if you put it straight down, uh, just straight up and down perpendicular with the cell, but that you know that puts a lot of direct pressure, so eh, not always such a good idea. Uh, but pushing down at an angle, you're safe. Uh, within reason, you know, it's not a blanket uh, disclaimer. All brushes are different, so you got to be careful. Now, this encapsulant, <clears throat> this product, Solar Tight 384, takes three or four days to cure. Now, right now, it's not all that warm where I live, so it may even take longer. Some people put Tedlar on the back of their solar cells. That's that white, uh, shiny material that uh, you typically see on all manufactured cells. I don't use Tedlar. Uh, and the reason why is I like to allow the heat to dissipate off the cells unencumbered by Tedlar. So it's a matter of preference. Um, now here you see me tilting up as I, I talked about tilting up the frame to allow the encapsulant to flow under the cells. Just remember you can't do this for very long because the encapsulant will flow over the sides. So just a couple seconds on either angle you know, lift, put this side down, lift up the other one, lift up the left side, lift up the right side. Then we lay it flat, put the levels on, make sure it's perfectly flat, and we let it air dry. Don't touch it for four days. We'll see you then when it cures, and I'll show you the result. Thank you for watching.